Good morning, introduction to philosophy theory class. My name is Julian. And I'm Jeneline. To my left we have (laughs) Jeneline. It is a chilly morning, but we have hot coffees. Thank you for joining us on this um, final class in the introduction to Zizek, the Vanishing Mediator series. We're so glad that you you are here joining us as per usual. Welcome to our learning community. If you're joining us for the very first time, Welcome. Anybody can join. These classes are designed for beginners. They're supposed to be easy to access and hopefully easy to understand. Even though it's the last class, you haven't missed anything because previous classes are archived. That's right. Archived where? Archived on IGTV (laughs) and YouTube. Secret archives. (laughs) (laughs) And we also want to say a big thank you to our patrons who continue to finance this operation, this project who allow us to keep teaching exactly what we want to keep teaching, which is just the ultimate luxury. So Mm -hmm. thank you to our patrons. And of course, if you're joining us from anywhere around the world, I see someone from India already. Yeah. (laughs) Please do leave a comment letting us know where you're joining us from. That always makes us very happy, both on YouTube and on Instagram. Just give us a quick comment where you're joining us from. Uh, We're always very keen to hear that. We have someone joining us from Serbia. We have someone joining us from India. We are currently in Washington. Um, So yeah, if you want to join us today, it's going to be a one hour class lecture introduction uh, to some of the key ideas of Slavoj Žižek. In this idea, we're going to be, uh, in this class, we're going to be talking about Slavoj Žižek's theory of the three reals. What are the three reals? Um, And we're going to talk about how that relates to Lacan, how that relates to Kant, how that relates to Hegel, what that tells us about many different things. So thank you guys for posting. I see Italy, I see Frankfurt, I see Chile, I see Brazil. So many wonderful places. Germany and Canada. We feel Malaysia. Malaysia, yeah. We feel truly humbled. (laughs) So thank you so much for sharing with us where you're joining us from today. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, I just want to very quickly plug the fact that my ebook, The Hermeneutic Temptation, which is an introduction to the ideas of Zizek, Lacan, Hegel, and Marx, is still available for another week, one more week on Patreon, um, and then it's gonna be gone. It's gonna be gone forever. Um, and a lot of you guys have been asking me why, why write a book and put it on the internet only to remove it? And the reason that I'm going to be removing the book is A, because I'm writing another one, but B, because it served its purpose. It was supposed to be a summary of the previous lecture series. It was supposed to be a short 100 page document that expressed all the ideas that we covered in the previous three months. And I think it was a wonderful thing at the time, and we're ready to move on to the next thing. So if you'd like to download my ebook, The Hermeneutic Temptation, which is an introduction to Zizek, Hegel, Lacan, and Marx, make sure that you get it within the next six days, because after that, it's going to be deleted forever. If you'd like to download it, it is on my Patreon. Simply click the link in my bio. And of course, if you become a patron, it will also give you downloads to all the classes. So if you're thinking about catching some of these classes as an audio file, as a podcast, you'd get that as well. Okay, I think we should just jump right in. Let's dive right in. Is that right? Yeah. Three reels. I'm really intrigued. All right, wonderful. Yeah, and thank you, Jenny, for being here this morning. I yeah, super appreciate that. That's always wonderful. Um, okay, so I want to start with... What's the matter? Push it. Push what? <laughs> We're on camera. You need to explain what you're doing. Julian has a very tricky... You're infantilist. <laughs> I like go. it. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you for opening my coffee mug for me. <laughs> it's gonna it. drive me crazy. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> okay, <right>. I'm done. <laughs> That's perfect. Everybody who watched these classes knows that you're the you're the puppet master here, so we, we appreciate that. All right, so I want to start with something. We're gonna start really easy in a way that everybody can understand, and then we'll slowly bring in some more theoretical concepts as we move on. Mm-hmm. And I want to start with something that one of my favorite directors said. This is um, Hayao Miyazaki. Hayao Miyazaki being a director of animated films. Um, the director of Studio Ghibli. You've probably seen films like Spirited Away or Princess Mononoke, etc. And um, Miyazaki, in an interview once said, that the most unfair thing you can say to somebody, especially to a child, is don't be a bother. Don't bother me. And he said that what's unfortunate is that we expect from a lot of people that good behavior is when there's somebody who doesn't bother you, when there's somebody who's essentially invisible, especially if you're an employee working at a company or if you're somebody 
uh, who's raising children, of course, it's tempting to say, I don't want to be bothered by you. And one of the things that Miyazaki said, he said, first of all, it's impossible. He says, it's impossible not to bother people. In fact, the whole point of being alive is that your very presence is a bother to bother to somebody else. As much as a parent loves their child, there are moments in which the child bothers the parent. They disrupt the unity of what that parent's life was. Mm -hmm. Every life is in a sense a disruption, a disruption of a certain environment. Now on a radical ecological level, you could say that human beings bother nature. We disrupt nature. On the level of the family, you could say that we sort of fruitfully bother each other. And the point isn't to say that people are bad. The point isn't to say that people are a nuisance and that you should be an introvert that you keep to yourself. Instead, what Miyazaki is essentially saying is the very same thing that Lacan always insisted, which is that the one thing you have in common with everybody else is difference. And it's think about it for a moment. It's kind of a paradox, right? The idea that the one thing that unites all of us, the one thing that is truly universal, the one thing that is, is something that we share amongst ourselves is precisely difference, that we are different from each other. And you could also say that if you tell a child that they're unique, that your existence here on earth is one of a kind, that there's never going to be another person like you, that's true, but it's only true because of everybody else. And so the very condition of your perception of being unique is predicated on the idea that everybody else is unique as well. In other words, what's universal isn't your uniqueness, that's particular, what's universal is difference itself. And Lacan always insisted that the only universal thing in the world is difference. Difference between people, difference between ideas, difference of course being another way of talking about negation. Anything that differs by its very nature is a process of negation. Now last week we talked about three different types of negation. You have negation between two positive forces, two things that clash. You have internal negation, such as in a paradox, like the idea that um, the aphorism from Spider-Man, if you expect disappointment, you can never be disappointed. Of course, here we should immediately add the properly Freudian retort to this, mm -hmm. which I've seen floating around on the internet, which the Freudian Lacanian retort to the aphorism in Spider-Man, if you expect disappointment, you'll never be disappointed, is of course, expect disappointment and you'll still be disappointed, right? That's the death drive in a nutshell. <laughs> that, that's, that's internal negation. And then we have constitutive negativity. We have a kind of negation that is a positive substance specifically through its absence of a material reality. For Kant, this is the idea of the antinomy. An antinomy is something which can only be thought but not materialized. Something like God, something like the soul. And so difference, again, is universal. Difference is either difference between things we have difference within things, or we have some things that contain difference as their own positive entity. Mm -hmm. and of course, that's what it means to be alive. That's what it means to be a human being. You are difference. You are difference writ large. When somebody tells you that you're unique, what they're telling you is that you're different. Now, different not as in extra, but different as in you exist because of difference to and with others which you experience as an internal difference within yourself. As in, am I really the person I want to be? Am I really the person who I should be? And so when Miyazaki says that it's unfair to tell people that they shouldn't be a bother, he's actually saying something very hopeful, which is that as soon as you accept that everybody is a bother, as soon as you accept that everybody bothers and is bothered, you realize that the core universal principle of being alive, of being part of humanity, is precisely that you have to choose who you want to be bothered by and who you would like to bother. And I think that that's ultimately the closest I can get to a definition of love. Love is saying, not only do I not experience you as a bother, in other words, what you, when you bother me, I enjoy it, but I actually like being bothered by you. And then you choose somebody, you find somebody who also likes being bothered by you. And then you sort of spend the rest of your life bothering each other, <laughs> which is a very like another twist on Sartre's idea that love is conflict. It's not to say that you torture each other, that you make each other unhappy, but you accept that the person who will most fundamentally bother you at the most intrinsic level, the person that when you wake up in the morning, you see mm -hmm. the ultimate like neighbor is your partner. And now you can start understanding why for Freud, the two most monstrous figures are both the figure of the neighbor and the figure of the lover. 
Now, the neighbor is the impossible other, the person who exists on the other side of the wall, the person you know is there, but you blot out of your existence. The person you're in love with, your partner, the person you spend your life with, is a kind of internalized neighbor. It's the other that is always there through which you see yourself. Because that's the thing about being in a long-term relationship. When you're in a long-term happy relationship, you see yourself, you experience yourself through the eyes of your partner. And if your partner views you with loving and uh, an affectionate gaze, that becomes internalized. It becomes a loving and affectionate gaze that you have towards yourself. And so there's a relationship there between those two types of others. Mm -hmm. Now, another person who reached that conclusion in a slightly more sardonic way was, in fact, Kierkegaard. And Kierkegaard has a really interesting theory about the neighbor. Now, in last week's class, we already established that the Lacanian real, and you can go back to that class if you want to see the full take, is the neighbor. The neighbor is the person who secretly contains the truth of your existence, which is that you wouldn't experience yourself without the other, without other people. There is no true, authentic self that exists before the encounter with other people. And so what you experience as yourself is the process of realizing that you are perceived by others and then subsequently trying to fill in that gap to, in a sense, adequately perform being yourself for the gaze of the other, which of course is the gaze that you experience yourself. That's the symbolic. And the neighbor is the real because the neighbor contains the truth about that exchange, the truth that you disavow. Now, I mean, that's a summary of last week. Now, Kierkegaard has an interesting idea. Kierkegaard says that the only, the only neighbor that you can truly love, remember like the Christian adage, love thy neighbor like thyself. The only neighbor you can truly love is the dead neighbor. And Kierkegaard isn't saying that you should go out and kill your neighbor. That's obviously not what he's saying. Instead, Kierkegaard is actually making an observation about how love works. Kierkegaard says that if you love somebody for specific attributes, then strictly speaking, that's not Christian love. For him, that's pagan love. Now, what's the difference between pagan and Christian love? Well, pagan love for Kierkegaard is when you love something according to its lovable attributes. In other words, I have a list. This is sort of like when you talk about having a type. I have a list of things that I find to be admirable or lovable, things that I'm looking for in a partner. And if I find somebody who has those, then I will be in love with them. The problem, of course, is that this creates the possibility that you would find somebody who has more of those features. In other words, that you wouldn't really love them you would simply be satisfied with them until you found somebody better coming around the corner. Of course, this is the problem that I think a lot of young people find themselves in when they're in a relationship for the first time, which is that they're so intrigued by having a relationship that they'll pretty much take anything they can get. And then as soon as somebody, quote unquote, better comes around, they, they leave for another person. Well, they think that they're supposed to be looking for particular kinds of attributes. And part of the discovery in a relationship is saying this is either this is what I want or this is what I don't want. This is what is like non-negotiable or this is something that I can tolerate. Sorry, I was going to bring you in and time. Yeah, no, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, like... We, you shouldn't treat your relationships as like a resume where you're working your way up through the hierarchy of dating. And so Kierkegaard basically says that if you love somebody for what they are, for the attributes they represent, for their beauty or their talent or their money, etc., then strictly speaking, that's not love. Strictly speaking, that's just, you know, you've, you've met certain requirements, which isn't to say that that can't be a part of love. Now, Kierkegaard says that strictly speaking, love would be the opposite of that. Love would be that you love the thing in them that is impossible. In, a Lac in Lacanian terms, this is love is loving somebody for what is more in them than is in them. Lacan says that we love the philosopher, the idea of the philosopher, because we think that they have reached the kind of wisdom that we have not yet. Of course, the philosopher hasn't. He's just as clueless. The definition of a good teacher is somebody who doesn't teach you how to be wise. That would be totally ideologically suspicious. The definition of a good teacher is fundamentally the one who teaches you what the teacher doesn't know so that you can identify the gaps in the thinking of the teacher. It's also why the 
the progress, the history of progress of philosophy isn't saying I'm going to take the best of what has been thought and done and improve upon that. It's going to be to say, I'm going to think that which cannot be thought under the historical circumstances of the current generation of thinkers. That's what it means to pass on the baton. To be a philosopher is to be in a relay race where you're holding onto the baton as long as you can, and then somebody snatches it from you and keeps going. Okay, so back to the idea of loving the neighbor. Kierkegaard says that the only, the only way that you can love the neighbor is if the neighbor is dead. Now, the basic way to understand that, first of all, is to say we have this expression where we say nothing but good about the dead. <laughs> In other words, as soon as somebody has died, no matter how horrific they are, we usually tend to, like, eulogize them. Is that the word? Yeah. yeah? Mm-hmm. In, a very, in very optimistic terms. And so what Kierkegaard is essentially saying is that you have to love somebody, the neighbor, as if they were already dead, as if you were not invested in their particular substance of their very being. Of course, Kierkegaard's being a little bit cheeky here because obviously you don't want to love somebody unconditionally in that sense. You can't just walk up to somebody and say, I love you so much, I'm going to treat you as if you were dead. (laughs) And of course, that's Kierkegaard's slightly subversive and almost ironic take on the Christian idea of agape or unconditional love. The idea that your love should be transcendent because it's not detached to the particular qualities of the person, but it's attached to the universal condition of, of existence itself. But here's the problem. If that's your definition of love, that you love somebody as if they'd already died, then you get into this really scary place, which is, well, what if they were actually dead? Wouldn't it be better if they were dead? In other words, you start realizing that the universalizing humanist, humanizing gesture of love yourself like thy neighbor is not only love yourself as if thy neighbor were dead, but love yourself as if you were already dead. And the love yourself as if you were already dead is, of course, perfectly encapsulated in today's wellness trends. The idea that you essentially embalm yourself as a living corpse under layers of face cream <laughs> that you cut out enormous amount of all things from your diet until you're eating just, I don't know, whatever, right. some kind of like powder or something. <laughs> the idea that your, your life becomes about maximizing lifespan instead of living a rich experience. Now, this is something that Zizek has talked about quite a bit. Zizek has always said that one of the interesting things about our contemporary ideology is that we increasingly want to have the thing deprived of its essential content. For example, um, I don't know, you could say like a sugar-free gum or alcohol-free beer, or you could say sex without consequences. In other words, like not just obviously, Mm -hmm. not just using a, what do you call this? I was going to say antiseptic, but no, not just using like, no, no, not just using a condom, like safe sex, but also like specifically pornography, like okay. the idea of sex without actual sexual intercourse. Mm-hmm. And of course, virtual reality mm-hmm. is another layer of this, because what is virtual reality? If not reality without reality, reality taken away from its most fundamental content. And the more we slip into the re- into virtual reality, it's not that we're becoming our true self in the virtual reality. We remain attached to our physical self. And what happens increasingly within virtual reality is that our physical self becomes like an embarrassment to us. It's like the one thing keeping us to the real world. And so what we're really seeking today are forms of detachment that are sold to us as retachment, as fighting alienation. As in like, if you meditate, you'll be more conscious of yourself. If you cut down your diet, if you're a minimalist, you'll be a more fulfilled person. Mm -hmm. If you're somebody who starts planning your insurance and your death and your all those things already, you'll be happier. Um, And so what we've done essentially is that we tried to resubjectivize the experience of being in the world by means of benching ourselves, by means of saying we're going to try to take away the essence of what it means to be alive. Now, this is not a normative argument. I'm not trying to tell you how to live. Instead of what I'm saying is that when Kierkegaard identifies that true love, true Christian love, agape, unconditional love, is the love of the dead neighbor, it refracts upon the Christian idea that you love your neighbor like yourself, which means that the way in which people love themselves is as if they were already dead. In other words, the best way to love yourself, ironically, is to treat yourself as if you were already a corpse, a corpse in waiting. And here we have essentially another twist on the Lacanian idea of the symbolic death, the second death which is that symbolic death is not just when you're symbolically dead. It's not when you're dead to the world. It's not when you've been canceled. Symbolic death is when you live outside of your own experience of life. You found ways to stand aside and reflect upon your life 
from not within, but from outside. This is essentially the complex that we could refer to as the otter complex. One of the things that otters do is they create like these burrows underwater, like amazing constructs, like entire like mansions essentially of burrows that otters have built. And what the otters do is that a lot of the time they don't live in it. They'll actually be outside the burrow examining it and like futzing it and like making little changes and collecting more wood and beaver. Is it beavers? Oh, but it's beavers. Okay, otters and beavers are the same to me. <laughs> the otter principle, otter complex, beaver. Thank you. Otters and beavers. What is the difference between otter and beaver? Um, otters, I think, um, I don't know. They, they're they more, uh, they tend to be in the water more often. And beavers are the ones that have the big teeth and cut down the oh, trees like the, and make yeah, yeah. dams. So, yeah, dams. Okay, yeah. yeah, so beavers. Beavers make a dam. And then a lot otters of... Otters are the cute one with the little selfish. And the funny thing about beavers is that yes. they don't spend a lot of time, like, actually being in the dam. Like, they're actually, like, building the dam is itself the process and mm-hmm. reflecting upon it. And this is essentially the idea of the death drive. The idea of the death drive for Freud and Lacan, as I've said many times before, isn't that you want to be dead. It's not that you're moving towards death in like a Heideggerian fashion. It's not that, as as St. Paul said, every second that you're alive, you're in the process of dying. Every, every breath that you exhale is closer to your last breath. That's not what it is. It's not a clock winding down. Instead, it's about one of the central fundamental conditions of impossibility of your life itself which is another way of saying that the way in which you experience being alive is ironically by benching yourself and observing your life from afar. This is exactly the point of taking a picture of yourself on Instagram and posting it. It's not just for the gaze of the other. It's specifically so that you can look at yourself as if you were an other. It's the process essentially of loving yourself as if you were already dead. After all, that's what it is. It's like, if I had a eulogy in which there would be a perfect picture of me, that's the picture I've just posted to Instagram. It's the process of making yourself symbolically dead. And so what we don't always understand is we look towards social media and we say what's bad for us about social media is that we're not in the real world and we don't have real authentic connections with other people. And you know, we, we, we just co- compare ourselves to others, but that's not the fundamental problem with social media. The fundamental problem with social media is that it's too good at giving us what we really desire, which is to love ourselves as if we were already dead. In other words, to put your very life on hold, to think that something doesn't matter or exist unless you document it and record it and sort of historicize it for the gaze of the other. And the problem is that it's pleasurable. People wouldn't do it unless it was enjoyable. You wouldn't become addicted to posting things on the internet about your life unless it gave you pleasure, unless it triggered serotonin. And so part of the death drive is that what gives you quote unquote serotonin is precisely this process of saying, I'm going to love myself as if I were already dead as if I were already cataloging the story of my life as seen from an external vantage point. And of course, the, the, again, to go back to the idea that difference is universal, that is the precondition for doing that. Hmm. The whole point of social media is that you can bathe in the process of being bothered by other people and bothering others. That is what social media is. It's an enormous bother in which you enjoy watching yourself bother others. In other words, receive attention from them. That's of course also why we live in the attention economy. The attention economy is simply another way of saying that we can monetize the process of bothering each other and wanting to be a greater bother to others than we are to ourselves. Fundamentally, what's so terrifying about boredom is that when you're bored is that you become a bother to yourself. And that's what's unbearable, essentially. Okay, we should probably take a (laughs) step back. Have a sip of coffee. Okay, so... (laughs) Already we're talking about, essentially, <clears throat> what, what we're talking about, Zizek has three reels. Zizek says what's interesting about the real. Remember, we talked about the reels being the neighbor, but it's not just the physical neighbor. It's this principle that we talked about. It's the internal paradox of, like, <laughs> the idea of loving your neighbor as if they were already dead and loving yourself as you were already dead. <coughs> it's okay. Sorry. No, no, it's totally fine. You don't have to follow this. <laughs> And so Zizek says that instead of one reel, there should actually be three reels. There's the imaginary reel, the symbolic reel, and the real reel. Now, what is the imaginary reel? There's a couple ways of illustrating this. First of all, if we stick with our previous theme, the imaginary reel comes, comes to the forefront in a couple ways. For example, what is money? A lot of people say, oh, money is just a social construct, etc., right? Like, it's just something that we've given value to. 
But it's something much more complex than that. Money is the great differentiator. Not just in terms of I have more money than you have, but money is a way to keep consequences away. Money is a way to keep people away. Money is a way to say we don't need to have a social relation. Money is how we avoid problems. Yes, money is... And of course, money can create problems, but when you give somebody money to do something, you don't have to have a social exchange. You're saying, I'm paying you to do X, and this money is the represent representative of this exchange. In other words, you don't have to bother me. I don't have to bother you. We just pay. Of course, the irony about the liberal attitude towards money is to disavow this process. The liberal attitude towards money is always to say, I'm paying you, but I want you to know that I still see you as a human being. I want you to know that actually we could have been friends. It happens to be that I'm paying you, but I'm also helping you out because I'm creating a work opportunity for you, etc., etc. That's the liberal ideology of money. It's to say, let's pretend like this isn't just a financial exchange. Let's, ex- let's pretend like we're actually besties. And there's something, of course, that's a little bit more vile about the liberal approach to money in that way, which is trying to like re-imbue money with this idea of a social relation. Of course, what's vile about it is that there's an unstated, disavowed power instability there, or power, what do you, like, what would you call that? Like a disequilibrium. Diso- that's nice, big word. <laughs> Diso- disequilibrium. It's unequal. And so you can say, well, my cleaning lady is my best friend, but she's not. She would not be in your house unless you were paying her. You were say- yeah, well, I was thinking of, I think a perfect example of this and going back to uh, the relationship of the neighbor is a phenomenon we were talking with someone about because um, homeowners associations don't really exist on the West Coast where we are, but they're very common on the East Coast where you have to pay a fee to a group of people who regulate the aesthetics of your neighborhood. And so if you're lawn is not maintained properly or the paint on your house is peeling then you can be fined by this organization or if they object to when you put up your holiday decorations and so you've so you've sort of in a sense outsourced being bothered by your neighbors to an organization that has become a financial Mm. transaction of course there's a whole racist history about how homeowners associations were built on the idea of trying to, you know, maintain the integrity of a neighborhood by excluding racial minorities, obviously. So I'm actually very much in favor of this because I think the best thing you can do for it, not in favor of the racial (laughs) stuff, but like homeowners associations, associations, because I think the best thing you can do for a community is to create this external figure that you can have a shared hatred for. (laughs) The problem with the whole idea of the hippie shared community, there is no power structure, etc., is of course there's a power structure. You can't get rid of authority and hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is that within any egalitarian collective community, of course there's a power structure, except you all have to participate in the collective disavowal of Mm -hmm. that power structure, Mm -hmm. which is much more oppressive. There's something profoundly liberating about saying, let's just all hate the landlord together. (laughs) Like, the worst thing is a landlord who insists on being your friend. Like, they're trying to do you a favor. No, no. The landlord does you a favor by saying, I am the skeevy, conniving landlord, and you can hate me as much as you want. That's part of why I charge you a little bit more every year. Mm -hmm. That's the surplus charge every year, is so that you can hate me just a little bit more. There's nothing more satisfying than being able to say, the problem in my life isn't me or my partner or my house. The problem in my life is my landlord. Mm -hmm. Right. I think like Mm -hmm. I know I'm being a bit facetious, but like there's genuinely something there where it's like it's worse to insist on being friends with somebody. Every parent and every child will experience this at some point, which is that as a parent, you can choose at a certain point. You can choose either you let your child go. Of course, you still are in contact, but, you know, you let them have their life or you insist on being their best friend. And no child wants to be a best friend with their parent, of course. Eventually, over time, something could relate. But the whole point of being a parent is that you are precisely the one person who is not their friend. There's no way in which you could, strictly speaking, be their friend. And so what you can be is you can both pretend like your friends, but that just means that what the parent really wants is to love you, not as you, but wants to love you through themselves. They want it to be a pair. Mm -hmm. They don't want you to actually have your life. Parents can be very jealous when it comes to you having a partner, for example, because as soon as you have a partner, then you become the object of affection of somebody else. They start taking care of you. 
a parent, in a sense, wants to hold on to their power, the wanting to be the person, the special privileged person who gets to take care of you. Anyway, we're generalizing here. What I'm talking about here is the idea of the symbolic real, uh, no, imaginary real, the imaginary real. And one of the things with the imaginary real is that when we pay somebody, when we give them money, we're often doing it so that we don't have to invest into a symbolic relationship. In other words, money becomes the symbol of non-relationship. You could think even like this is the basic idea of prostitution is to say, I don't want to have a relationship to you with you. I just want to have this exchange. Ironically, it's why a lot of people, a lot of sex workers talk about the fact that many part, many of the men who come in, of course, there's also female and male sex workers, but a lot of the clients who come in, increasingly what they want is they want attention. They want affection. It's like what they're paying for is to be symbolically seen by the other person. And we have like a closed loop. But the same thing holds true when it comes to humanitarianism. This is like the, the, the disavowed sex work element in humanitarianism, not actual sex work, but the principle that when we give other countries, third world countries, a lot of money, the implicit demand is to say, don't bother us with your problems. We don't actually want you to confront us with the way in which the global economy and the quote unquote neoliberal world market, world order, free markets, etc., And the corruption and, created by financial aid. Yeah. Financial aid, financialization, the way in which the, you know, the World Trade Organization has created demands for you that you cannot meet, etc. We don't want to hear about that, but here's some money to get you into the next year. And so a lot of humanitarianism, as, as much as it's coming with liberal values about why we're giving money, and of course it's better to have money than no money, is specifically to say, we want to keep you at a distance. We don't want your problems to actually be here. This is the response to a lot of protests as well, is to say, well, give us your demands so we can consider them and then we can take them into consider, we can then give you some kind of concession. But a real radical protest says, we don't have demands. We're not in a negotiation with you. We are the people who are confronting you with the untenability of the system itself. And you know that it can't continue and we're just telling you the hard, honest truth. A real protest, a radical protest in that way, isn't saying you want something from those in power. You want to point out the hollowness in the power itself. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is when we, when we encounter the symbolic real, is we're encountering an emptiness within power itself. In other words, we start realizing that what power is, is essentially a shell. Power, power is something that doesn't exist by itself. There's this Emerson quote that was quoted in the Succession mm -hmm. series that we watched, which is like, behind what is it, behind every institution is the shadow of a great man. Well, what's important here is not the great man. What's important is the shadow. Behind every institution, behind every power structure is a shadow, an empty space cast by the institution itself. In other words, the institution retroactively legitimizes and suggests that there was an a priori power from which it legitimately derived. That's what power is. Power isn't here we have the holy grail of power and it gives energy to all of these institutions. Power is in the institutions, in the power structures that retroactively suggest that there is a secret legitimizing agent behind them. And of course, resistance and protest is precisely to point out that there is nothing behind these institutions, that there is no inherent power to them save for the institution itself. And so the fundamental core of power is essentially empty. And this is what you could refer to as the symbolic real. The idea that behind what we experience as difference, as institutions, as institutionalized power structures, is a kind of formal emptiness. And of course, it's the most radical gesture you can make is to say, let's fill in the way in which we interpret this radical emptiness. Let us become the agents of symbolization. Let us be the persons who d dictate what an institution is, what it can do, what it can mean for people. And so once you realize that there is no a priori power that gives legitimacy to the state, to institutions, to schools, that's when you can actually say, well, this is where we can test those organizations and start filling in what they could be. This is how all change happens. What, what is normal today was not normal 10 years ago. What was normal 10 years ago was not normal 10 years before that. Mm -hmm. Change is continuous, and it's those who are in power who benefit from suggesting that nothing can ever be changed. 
And so we're back at the conditions of possibility. Remember philosophy, and this is the political link within philosophy, philosophy isn't to say, let's think about the abstract X in the sky. Philosophy no longer has a transcendental purpose. How do we escape our mortal coil and go towards the heavenly father? That's not philosophy. Philosophy is to say, what are the conditions of possibility for the way in which reality itself can be perceived? And the way in which reality is perceived is, of course, structured by the institutions and the society that we live in. And so the symbolic real isn't to say that we exist as symbols to others. The symbolic real is that behind the curtain of the symbolic is nothing. There is no inherent legitimizing agent towards difference and power. Instead, to go back to Lacan, the only universal is difference, which is a kind of emptiness. And once you fill in that difference, you can create new formal contents. Sorry, am I going like too hard here? Nope. We're in the last class of the <laughs> series, so like we got to like <laughs> fit hit, it all in. Yeah, we got to hit these beats. <laughs> now, Zizek, that's the symbolic reel. It's the idea that behind the symbols of power, there is no in inherent substance. What is the idea? Uh, sorry, that's, yeah. Yeah. I was mixing up the imaginary real and the symbolic real. Now, Zizek has a slightly different theory of the symbolic real. Zizek says that you could also call the symbolic real the scientific real. Now, what is the scientific real? The scientific real is essentially mathematical formula. A mathematical formula tells you something about the reality of your existence, and yet it tells you nothing about the reality of your existence. When somebody shows you an equation a physical, for physics, like how gravity works, it's like, okay, but show me how it works. And so the very fact that you've put it into an abstract sequence doesn't have a direct bearing on your reality, even though you know that of course it does. And so you see the formula, which symbolizes something which happens on a day-to-day -day basis, apple falling out of the tree, and yet you feel in a weird way that it doesn't actually prescribe or describe what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And so for Zizek, the idea of the symbol symbolic real isn't just this emptiness, it's also specifically that which cannot be symbolized. And of course, that's what relates to power. Now, if the symbolic real is this idea that the power structure, which it sounds very like postmodern, but that's not at all how I mean it, um, that the, 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 the power structure is predicated on an imaginary filling in of an empty space, then you can also start understanding why Zizek and Lakov have always insisted that sexuality functions according to the same way. That sexual difference is the primary condition for being in the world. In other words, that if we go back to the Miyazaki idea that everybody is a bother, everybody is a bother to each other by means of sexuality. Now, of course, we could, meet, we could live in an asexual world. That's possible, but biologically not really tenable. And so sexuality becomes the marker of our universal difference. Sexuality becomes the way in which we are bothered by the other and we bother other people. This is also why it's so, so difficult to talk about today about like the idea of sexual harassment. In part, because there is a kernel of harassment to every encounter. Now, of course, there are degrees, you could say, right? Obviously, there's a difference between rape and going out for a coffee date. There's a degree of difference in intention. But at a fundamental level, every romantic encounter, every time we are seen by other people or observed or considered as a potential mate, there is something harassing in that. Well, not harassing, but let's say transgressive. Yeah, transgressive. Because I think this is, a really, this is a really complicated topic, and I think it's really easy to misunderstand the point that's being made, that there is an element in transgression of, uh, let's say, a sexual relationship. Yes, but we don't even have to go into the sexual relationship, yeah. right? Um, you could say, for example, that even on the level of seeing other people mm. is already being exposed to their gaze. If you overthink it, it becomes really hard to participate in society, mm -hmm. especially for women, of course, because women historically, societally, have been the sexualized objects of the gaze. Mm -hmm. And here's the funny thing. When we talk about this, there's this like proto proto-biological evolutionary fantasy, which is like, for example, well, everything functions according to sexual availability. So women wear makeup because the their red lips will look <laughs> more like engorged vulvas or something. Like mm -hmm. that's, but here's what's important. That is fantasy and not reality. Mm -hmm. Why is it fantasy and not reality? It's fantasy because it's a comforting notion that everything happens for a reason. It's comforting for people, probably mostly for men, to think that 
Displays of societal difference, such as makeup, such as appearance, only serve sexual exchange. So that is the fundamental utopian myth where everything happens for a reason. What's scary about it, the reason that you need that myth is precisely because sexual difference, displays of ownership of agency over your own sexual messaging or non-sexual messaging, your appearance, disrupts that fundamental unity. And so we need the retroactive fantasy of people like Jordan Peterson to tell us that, no, everything is as it should be. And that's where you end up in the sexist patriarchal narrative, which is women only exist as vessels of procreation. And if they adequately symbol to us their availability, they will be chosen as said incubators of life. I mean, it's a totally reductive non-evolutionary in many ways fantasy, reactionary fantasy about what it means to be a woman and a man that is designed to cover up the fundamental horror, which is the fact that sexuality is the universal difference of humanity itself. In other words, that we don't exist outside sexual differentiation. That, that horror, that gap is retroactively patched up with the alternate idea that we only exist for sexual differentiation. You were going to say something. Yeah, so we're still in the realm of the symbolic real. This idea where we have not just mathematical formulas, but this kind of like scientific logical reasoning that can explain and in a sense justify everything that sort of exists in society. This, this sort of hermetically sealed world of reasoning where everything happens for reasoning. Every, everything happens for a purpose in the sense. Yes. The only difference being that if you look at a, like an equation about physics yeah. or gravity, that is true. It's un- indisputably true. Yeah. Whereas these types of theories about evolutionary behavior, they are themselves the manifestations of a disavowed impossible symbolization, which okay. is the idea of universal difference. Okay. I know we're going a little bit fast here. <laughs> This is also like, this is my subjective interpretation because Zizek's idea of the symbolic real is a lot, it's a lot more dry. Hmm. It's simply that which cannot be properly thought. But, but we're, we're getting somewhere here. <laughs> so the question is, what is the real real? We have the imaginary real and the symbolic real. The imaginary real um, and the symbolic real are connected, of course, mm-hmm. right? In a sense, we have that which is symbolized and we have that which is imagined. When you think about money, for example, we have money being that which has no inherent value, but we create it as a way to keep difference formalized. We don't need to know each other. We actually exist as agents. You don't bother me because I pay you to do something. So here we have the idea of the imaginary real. We have the idea that we create a relationship with others, which is a relationship of non-relationship, the relationship by which you don't bother me because we have this arbitrary exchange of value being money. The symbolic real is, in a sense, what almost disrupts that. The symbolic real is the fact that we cannot properly escape sexual difference. We cannot properly escape just being a form of difference. Mm -hmm. What happens with the real real is that the real real is when we have, like, a tautological overlap between the two. For example, on the level of the imaginary, there's there's many things that we feel. For example, like, casual racism today. Mm -hmm. Casual... I'm not saying I'm a racist. I mean, maybe I'm a racist. But, like... Most people who are racist today, they don't go around saying, I'm, I hate black people, I hate Chinese people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's a kind of like disavowed racism where they say, well, something's just not right. For example, you could also say that people who are against the idea of transgender, often they say, well, I don't really have a problem with it, but it doesn't feel right. Mm-hmm. And that kind of it doesn't feel right. Here, always, here we're in the realm of the imaginary real, right? We want to keep the reality, the hard kernel of someone's otherness at a comfortable distance. We don't even want to have to explain why. It just doesn't feel right. Now, what happens with the real real is what on TikTok and on the internet people call um, when you say the quiet part out loud. When somebody says the quiet part out loud, it's sort of like a shocking confrontation with something that you wouldn't ordinarily say, something that usually would only exist on the level of the imaginary on the level of the symbol. I either symbolize my racism or I sim- or I imagine it as like, I'm not racist, but something's wrong with you. When you say the quiet part out loud, you're in the realm of the real real. You're in the realm of like the thing that is like fully like exposed in your face. And what's kind of beautiful is whenever you watch a video of somebody saying the quiet part out loud, 
where suddenly they say something like, well, yes, of course, there's going to be a great replacement in France. And, you know, the Jews have organized a conspiracy where Arabs are taking over French culture. It's like, wow, you just said the quiet part out loud. What's beautiful there is that in a weird way, that's the exact point at which it's lost so much of its power. Hmm. It's so blatant. It's Mm -hmm. just out there. You realize that a lot of the power of reactionary thought and reactionary gestures exists on that kind of disavowed, imaginary, and symbolic level. And then when it's simply out there, bereft of the imaginary real and the symbolic real, it's actually a little bit formless. And it's not that you can change that person's mind. It's that speech as speech, in a sense, doesn't do anything. It's actually at its least potent when it's spoken out loud that way. That's when it loses a lot of its political power, when mm-hmm. when it's just there. And everyone's like, <laughs> wow, you said the quiet part out loud. Now, the real real, of course, this is when like the, the surface level of the real real. But the opposite of that, of the real real, I know I'm not making a lot of sense, but we're at the end of lectures here, is that you also have a kind of, let's call it a kind of deadlock within the idea of enjoyment itself. Because here's what's so important for Zizek and Lacan. It always comes back to enjoyment, to like in French, like the jouissance. And the paradox of enjoyment is that you cannot access it directly. For example, to go back to the beginning of this class, that we enjoy loving ourselves as if we were already dead. In a weird way, we have more direct access to enjoyment when we're negating our own bodily pleasure when we're depriving ourselves, when we're putting ourselves on hold, that gives us a kind of weird satisfaction. It's like if you're a minimalist and you say, I own 10 objects, and you sort of neurotically count those objects and you put them on display, there's a kind of like slightly sick pleasure that comes from not having things. You go onto YouTube for minimalism and it's, here's what I don't buy, here's what I don't have, here's what I don't do. And there's like a deep satisfaction that comes from not doing, not owning, not buying. And that kind of pleasure in negation is ultimately the real real. And Jizek has a really sick example of this. I told this to Jenling yesterday, I was like, I'm not sure if I should use this in the class. But (laughs) Jizek's example is a speech from Goebbels, uh, World War II Nazi era speech. And he says, this is, this he says, the ultimate speech of enjoyment. If you produce one of those little books one of those little booklets with like the greatest speeches of all time, this would be like the joy speech. And I'm being sardonic, of course. No, we were talking, the the through line was the does the spark joy? Yeah. Question. Yeah, I don't want to be accused, like I don't want to do Mary Kondo bashing. Oh no, I Because I know Mary doing... Kondo is, a, is really important to a lot of people, but I say, essentially, yes, Mary Kondo has this rule, which is does this spark joy? Mm-hmm. And there's something... You're right. You can take everything too far. And this is an example of that. This isn't like a slight against Marie Kondo. Anyway. Well, we have to introduce who Marie Kondo is for all of our <laughs> viewers who are not from the United States or other regions. It's okay. So Marie Kondo is a, sort of a leading figure in the minimalism wellness movement who essentially has this, this maxim, this rule about cleaning up, where she says, um, you have to decide whether something sparks joy or not. If it sparks joy, you keep it. If it doesn't spark joy, you get rid of it. And and so Jenny and I were joking about the sparking joy. Now, what is the reactionary totalitarian element within the whole sparking joy idea? Well, what really sparks joy isn't the object. What sparks joy is what you're throwing away. That's the pleasure of the Mary Kondo approach. It's not saying here's an object that sparks so much joy that now there's a source of joy around which my life is structured, like a a power vessel of energy of joy. Instead, the secret disavowed truth of the Mary Kondo approach is that what sparks joy is getting rid of all the other crap. That's what sparks joy. And you need the retroactive illusion of the minimal core of enjoyment to throw away everything else. Around the item that you have selected as sparking joy, you get to have the secret enjoyment, the jouissance, the surplus enjoyment of throwing away everything else. Now, here's the totalitarian humanist kernel within the sparking joy. Let's go to the Goebbels speech. Goebbels is addressing a crowd before World War II. And he says, my dear Germans, we're going through a period of national hardship. Everyone says, yeah, national hardship. And he says, What we have to do 
is we have to tighten our belts. Yeah, tighten our belts. <laughs> like austerity was the same thing, of course. And what we have to do is we have to be real Germans and grit our teeth and show national resolve in the midst of hardship. Yeah, essentially. And so it continues that way. And Goebbels slowly works himself up to saying, what if we really want to test our character, we're going to have to face our enemies. Yeah, if we really want to test our character with our enemies, we have to have total war. Yeah, and the crowd gets like increasingly ecstatic. Of course, what we know is the logical conclusion of this is, and we have to get rid of everything that doesn't spark joy. Yeah, which means the final solution, get rid of all the Jews. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's sickeningly anti-Semitic, of course. But Zizek says that this speech from Goebbels is the perfect speech of joy. He's sparking a frenzy and an ecstatic joy in the crowd at the very idea of losing everything they have, of throwing away everything they have in a kind of like, I don't know, empty madness of total war in which the true German character is supposed to emerge. Hence now, book burning, hence sort of the orgy of destruction. Yeah, exactly. Book burning is nothing else than saying what sparks joy, Mein Kampf, and everything else gets thrown away. There's, there's the totalitarian element there. Now, of course, you will see resonances to, for example, other ethno-nationalist movements like Brexit. The whole idea of Brexit was to say, let's find again what true British culture is and British strength and grit. And of course, we can do without the European Union. And what the liberals never understood about Brexit was precisely that because Brexit wasn't going to work, because Brexit was going to be a shit show, because it was going to make the very people who voted for it miserable, that's what sparked joy. Brexit was the merry condoing of Britain's relationship to the European Union. Mm -hmm. They lost joy in being British. And so how do you find ways to spark joy? Well, by getting rid of all the other European countries. The Brits basically put the European Union on their bed and said, we're taking out the union, mm -hmm. and throwing away everything else. And there's this blissful, ecstatic moment of saying, ha, huh, I feel so in control of my life, and now nothing is cluttered, and we no longer have the European Union, we just have Britishness. Of course that's pleasurable, but that's deeply reactionary. And so we're actually back again in a weird way to the idea that Kierkegaard had about loving your neighbor as if they were already dead. The best way for the Brit to love Europe is to love them as if Europe was already dead. The best way for the minimalist Marie Kondo approach to love your possessions is to throw them away. The best way to love yourself is as if you were already thrown away, mm -hmm. essentially. And so the sparking joy is an empty core that is retroactively generated around the process of getting rid of everything else, treating it as if it were already dead. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's exactly the real real. That is the thing that we cannot access, and yet it's intrinsic to the very process. And so the scariest thing for the minimalist, the scariest thing for the Nazi, the scariest thing for, not to say that all minimalists are Nazis, whatever, I mean, I'm practically minimalist myself, but like the scariest thing is when you realize that the thing that sparks joy wasn't inherently joyful. What sparked joy was the process of getting rid of everything else. And this is something that we've insisted on throughout this course, which is this idea that, I mean, this is again the death drive, which is that what you experience as having a positive a priori content, yourself, your subjectivity, the thing that sparks joy, is that which is constantly being stripped away from you. Mm -hmm. That is how you experience life, as a stripping down of parts of your own consciousness. It's not the other way around. It's not that you start with an a priori formless substance upon which you build the experiences of life. No, the experiences of life take away from you. Every little thing you do in the world hurts. Everything takes away. Everything strips you down. Life wears you down, and that's what you experience as life. And so the sparking joy isn't innate. The sparking joy is through the stripping down. And you can realize that and emancipate yourself from it and be honest about it and realize that what sparks joy could be anything. Or you can remain stuck within the rea reactionary totalitarian liberal humanist principle, which is this idea that as long as you get rid of things, you will go back to that which originally had joy. Because here's the fundamental illusion, the Lacanian, the Lacanian illusion, is that there is an essence to be guarded. Remember, 
the idea of Brexit was that the only way that the European, uh, that the UK could preserve its essence was by stripping away the European Union. They didn't realize that there is no essence to being British except for the desire to strip away the European Union. That's what it means to be British now. That's the horror of still living in the UK is that British people are like, wait, now Britishness simply equals being the people who don't like being in the European Union. This is the, there is no essence to humanity as such. There is no essence behind the curtain. There is no one object you can own that will solve the process of all the other objects. And so this is what I've called the hermeneutic temptation in my previous book, right? The idea that behind the curtain, there exists something more. Now, to wrap up this lecture series, what is the point of this entire argument? The point of this entire argument is to illustrate Zizek's central idea, his Grundeinsicht, his, his original contribution to the history of Western philosophy, which can be summed up as follows. He applies the principle of the death drive and the principle of the pleasure principle of jouissance to the Kantian Hegelian metaphysical turn, the Kantian transcendental turn and the turn of Hegelian idealism, which we've talked about in the past 10 weeks ad nauseum. And what Zizek has simply argued, and this is like, it's a surprisingly simple insight once you realize it, but has very fruitfully developed over the course of, I don't know, 40 books or something like this, is simply the following. That the principle of the death drive, which is this self-relating negativity, that there is no true self, no authentic essence of you, can be applied precisely to the idea of subjectivity within the Kantian transcendental turn of Hegelian idealism. In other words, Kant realizes that you as subjective reason cannot reach essence or truth. Think about it. Kant's book is called The Critique of Pure Reason. Pure reason being direct access of your reason to the absolute. In other words, that the particular subset of existence, you, the subject, your mind can reach the absolute. Kant says it's not possible. Hegel simply says, well, Maybe it's that there is no absolute behind the curtain of reason. Maybe the curtain of reason, the barrier of reason, is itself how the absolute takes place. In other words, in Hegel's self-relating negativity. Zizek simply takes the idea of the Lacanian Freudian death drive and says, here we have an example of the formula, the functioning of self-relating negativity that we can identify in Kant and Hegel. It's a, it's a beautifully simple idea. Death drive applied to Kant and Hegel. Now, when Zizek did this, it was so taboo that he wasn't allowed to work as an academic. He wasn't considered properly Marxist because, of course, to be a Marxist wasn't to take psychoanalytic anti-Marxist structuralist principles and retroactively <laughs> jack them into the edifice of Kant and Hegel. That was considered anathema to the entire Marxist edifice. And so what Zizek has basically done is he's taken the Marxist tradition, which goes back to the Kantian turn, which goes through Hegel, because Marx was simply trying to, quote unquote, materialize and rewrite Hegel, to take that beast and to say, let's take these two electric wires of psycho psychoanalysis and plug those in there <laughs> and get it started. He's simply rehabilitating the idea of dialectical materialism through an injection of psychoanalytic theory. And that's what Zizek has done. That's it. That's all. And the last 12 weeks have been dedicated to explaining how he does that, to giving you a blueprint to the way in which Zizek takes psychoanalytic theory and plugs it in to the Kantian Hegelian edifice. That's what we've done in this series called The Vanishing Mediator. And of course, The Vanishing Mediator, if you've wondered, The Vanishing Mediator is simply you. The vanishing mediator is your experience of subjectivity, of being an individual. That's what Zizek calls the vanishing mediator. Remember, we started with the idea from Frederick Jameson that the vanishing mediator is the catalyst that gives rise to its own universal function through its perceived opposite. Now, that's super technical, but it simply means that you, the subject, the individual, the particular subset of being is what gives rise to the absolute substance of being. You are the vanishing mediator. That is the Hegelian insight. That substance equals subject. And you are that subject. That is the vanishing mediator. And that is this lecture series. So thank you guys so much. 12 weeks. We've had three months of back-to-back -back lectures every Monday. The vanishing mediator. A introduction to Zizek's theories and how he relates psychoanalysis to Kant and Hegel. If you've enjoyed these classes as much as I have, 
thank you. <laughs> if you've been bewildered <laughs> as much as I have, thank you. It's been my pleasure to teach these classes. Thank you to Jenly for being here today. My pleasure. It is so wonderful having <laughs> you here. What you don't always realize is that Jenlene is like the person who gives the drum beat to these classes. And thanks for letting me just solo it out in this final, final one hour. There is so much to cover. If you've enjoyed this class, if you would like to listen to the entire series, you can download them on my Patreon. It's 10 bucks for the entire series, the entire course. It's called The Vanishing Mediator. Uh, you can also sign up for $5 for the bonus Q&As that we do. If you've enjoyed these classes, if you'd like to be a part of the next series starting next week, please head over to my Patreon. That's www.patreon.com. That's Jillian Julian. That is how we can keep doing this. So thank you guys so much for joining us. It has been our absolute, absolute pleasure. <laughs> and um, yeah, on that note, thank you guys so much. It's been a wonderful three months. Thank you for letting me teach this lecture series called The Vanishing Mediator. And if you'd like to watch or listen to any of the classes in this series, please do head over to my Patreon. I really appreciate it. Plus, my book, The Hermeneutic Temptation, is available for another week. So if you'd like to get your hands on that, get it in the next week, because then it's gone. Yeah, it's gone at the end of the month. At the end of the month, that's right. Yeah, January 31st is the last day. All right. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Thank you guys Have so much, week. and we will see you next week. Bye-bye.